father uh, to get saved uh, in my early 20s. And uh, now we serve the Lord today and have a beautiful wife and kids who love the Lord. And uh, see this young man who was just standing here, who was a student in my high school science class, uh, get saved and surrender to preach and to be able to serve with young people and see them grow and surrender their lives to, to, to the Lord's service for eternity. I mean, there's nothing greater than serving the Lord. Amen. You know, getting saved is just the first step. You're just getting started. But if we're Christians, we never disturb what God's will is for our life. We're missing a whole lot of fun, I'm telling you. God is so good. Trusting Him. Uh, when we think of trusting God, sometimes we get fearful. But that's the best place to be in. He never fails. He never fails. God is so good. This morning, we're going to continue the biblical perspective of marriage. And I just pray our young people uh, here today this morning, as well as our parents and our grandparents, would really be encouraged and really trust the Lord in this area uh, that we're going to speak on this morning. Now, how many young people do we have? And I'm going to make, be very specific when I, when I mention young people. Ages 30 and below. Or, let, me, let me rephrase that. If you're, if you're a senior in high school up to age 30 and you're single, raise your hand. There's a couple married people that raise their hand. Oh, we're going to have some problems here. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Okay. We're going to have an outing next Sunday night after the Sunday, Sunday night service. Now, let me make this clear. If you don't come to Sunday night service, you can't participate. All right. We're going to set that ground rule. We're going to have a Sunday night service. And after that service, we're going to go out. This is next Sunday, not tonight, uh, for food. And we're going to have a movie afterwards here at the church. Okay. And so I'll fill you in on the details. We'll get all of our young adults together. All right. And uh, we'll have a good time. Amen? Amen? Some of you other people are looking sad. I'm sorry. We'll have something for you next time. All right. Here we go. We're looking at the Song of Solomon. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this because I spent some time on it last week. But it's going to tie into where we're going to go today as we complete this study. But we talked about this Shulamite uh, woman, poor woman. Uh, she was the least of all her brothers. They had her work in the field. We talked about that last week. And her brothers treated her very cruel, cruelly. It was kind of like a Cinderella story, so to speak. And so we find that Solomon notices her, and he promises to return to her one day. And it's, it sets the scene, and we see this uh, scene of her being in his court with the other women in Solomon's court, and she's tempted by them. And she takes a stand for God. She says, I'm going to wait for that one that God has for me. And we pick up in Solomon's, uh, the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and it's verse, uh, verse 3 through 6, talk about that. And it's also a picture of Jesus Christ. And him coming back for us one day and waiting for him. And as we wait for him, we serve him and we labor for him and we keep ourselves holy. Amen? Amen. But we see in verse 7, we see what she responds to those women in the courts who were living a fleshly life. She responds to them a particular way. And in verse 7, the Bible says, of Song of Solomon chapter 2, it says, I charge you, we see here, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rows and by the hinds of the fields, that you stir not up, nor wait my love, so he please. And so we see the first part of that verse, as she begins to charge them, they were tempting her to live the way they do. And the world does that, doesn't it? It will tempt our young people to live the way they do, to live out of the flesh. And the Bible tells us not to live as other Gentiles who know not God live, but we live according to the Word of God. And we're saturated by this media today, aren't we, yeah. that we see in our lives. And so we see here, we need to set some physical boundaries as well as emotional boundaries in our lives. And so we find her response in the second part of the verse, and she says this, she says, that she stir not up or excite not, nor wait my love till he please. And so we find a contrast to the world. The Bible says that as Christians, we'll procure your people. Zealous of good works. We're happy and excited to serve our Savior. At least that's the way we ought to be. Amen? And I talk about the ought to be's and the will be's. If we are saved, or if we are alive, I should say, we will be breathing. If you're not breathing, you're not alive this morning. Amen? Your heart will be beating. But you should be able to walk. You should be able to talk. But not everybody can. All right, and so there's some oddities or shouldas in the Christian life, and not every Christian lives up to that. But that's what God expects. We ought to love Him. We ought to want to serve Him. We ought to have our adoration for Him, for His love for us, and what He did for us. Amen. On Calvary's cross. That's what ought to be in our life. And so we see there's some boundaries being set. And so she says, "Stir not up." The thought is, "Excite not, awake not." She's saying her passions are not to be awake, awakened or excited until the right time. And we know that God has given us. Uh, these feelings, these emotional feelings for a reason. I often use the illustration of uh, loving to come home from school and know that mom has cooked some cookies, makes make some cookies for us. Uh, the other night we went out and took our kids out for sushi. They love that raw stuff for some reason. And uh, I remember the first time we went to the buffet, you know, I, I talked about this before, but uh, my son, he just eats whatever he sees. 
He's really a seafood lover, amen? And uh, we go to the buffet, and his eyes are just as big as saucers. And he takes off. He, he, he doesn't want to go back to St. Tom. He just say he's, he piles it up, and then he's, he's, he's trying to balance it out as he's walking back to the table. You know, and he's, he's real good at it, by the way. He can probably close his eyes and, and do it. But anyway, he's mastered that skill. Whereas my daughter, she'll get very little. And the last time we were there, I found out that she did that because she didn't want dad and mom to have to pay too much for the food. So honey, it's already paid for it. You know, you get as much as you want. She says, really, Dad? She gets excited. Well, anyway, we gave him a choice. It came time for, for, for dessert. We gave him a choice. And they give you ice cream there. And they go, they go back and they get the ice cream. They bring it to you. But if you want the cookies, then you just go up and get them. So I said, okay, you get a choice. You can't have both. You either get the ice cream or you get the cookies. Now, my daughter says, well, I'll take the ice cream. Well, it's going to take a few minutes, right? The waiter has to go back to the back. He's waiting on a few people. He has to get it. He has to bring it to you. Well, my son wanted his right now. So he got his cookies. And then he, he realized he made the wrong decision because it was a big bowl of ice cream. And the cookies were very small. So he's a picture of Esau, by the way, man. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, but well, we suddenly found it. And uh, where was I going with this? <laughs> well, anyway, he made his choice. He made the wrong choice, that is. And so we got back to the house, and we were um, going to bake cookies. We had done it before. My daughter was excited about doing it again. I said, now, we're going to make the cookies because you keep asking us to do it. And you, we're weary of you asking, just like in the Bible, so we're going to do it, but you're not going to eat them. Now, that's tough, isn't it? So we said, you already had your dessert at the restaurant. We're full. We're happy. We're content. At least mom and dad are. And so because we are, you've got to be too. And so you're not going to get any. And so we go there, and we cook the cookies, and we made like three or four batches. And man, by that time, they're salivating. And of course, mom made me the bad guy. <laughs> I had to be the one to put my fist on. No, you're not going to eat it, because that's what I said. And so I found out later when I went in the bedroom, she let them have part. She made a one big jumbo one, and they kind of divided. And that's okay. It's okay. No problem with that. But the point of the story is, is that God has given us those natural desires to, 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 to want things that are delicious, right? We start salivating, especially as, as God. We, the, the window to our heart is our stomach, amen, our appetite. Uh, you, you're a good cook. you got our hearts. I don't care who you are. But that's the way God designed us. But he designed us that way, especially when it comes to our our feelings and our emotions as well when it comes to the sexual aspect of our nature because God gave us the desires for a specific purpose, to propagate, right? And to bring other uh, little ones into the world and to teach them the ways of God. We have an inheritance. The Bible says our children are heritage of the Lord, amen? amen. We're to raise them to honor and love the Lord. And so it's no different, but I mentioned this before, you wouldn't take a one-year-old who just learned how to walk and, and tell them to cross the street. There's a right time that we express those emotions, those feelings, and as parents, we are to guard our children. You know, this big thing about you got to let them explore and all these things. We were out door knocking yesterday, and we, we ran upon a 28-year-old young lady. Uh, had Gave us her profession of faith. Uh, a little bit confusing, but it seemed like she had called upon the Lord at some point. She was convinced she was saved, so we didn't go any further. And we began to explain to her about the service that we had. She had never really gone to a Bible-believing church before. Her background was Catholic. And she says, well, I'm real nervous. I haven't been to church in such a long time. She's very nervous about this idea of going to church. By the way, that's a, that's a new thing out there. Most people just don't go to church. You know, there are some saved people out there that are just not church. They're not, they're not disciples. They haven't grown. And so we begin to explain to her all the activities that we have at the church and what we do with our young people and our children's ministries and so forth. And uh, she made a statement that I thought was profound. And I've heard it before. She says, well, I'll, I'll try to see if I can go visit, but I don't want to take my daughter. Daughter is five years old, mind you, because she says, I want her to be able to explore and figure out what she believes. And I thought to myself, how far away is that from the truth? But that's the mentality of people today. You know, we let them lose so early. And, and then she went on to say, well, my daughter asked me about Jesus the other day, and she was kind of confused about Jesus and the God and the whole thing. I'm thinking, that's because she's ready. She wants some answers. Amen. And I began to minister to her. You know, you don't want to overstep your bounds. You don't want to try to discourage anyone. But I, God burned my heart for that young lady. And I'm thinking, my oh my. I hate to say this, but sometimes we as Christians can be that way. With our own children. Now is the time, amen. There will come a time when it's too late. And so it's important that we get that. And so God has given us those desires. But he has a plan for those desires. And we find that she might have brought, had clearly drawn boundaries in her lives. I think of of Daniel in the Bible, we talked about this before, who said, I purpose in my heart that I would not have defile myself with the meat from the king's table. We have to set those boundaries in our life, those physical and emotional boundaries. I won't spend a lot of time because we, we spoke of this last time, but we'll move on. But we talk about the difference between love and lust and what that means. And the world sells lust, but the Bible teaches true love and unconditional love. And that's what we need to base our relationships upon, the love of Christ. And we're bombarded by society. 
and uh, we talked about Proverbs 4, 23. Let's go and read that. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Make that the issue and purpose of your life. That's what we're trying to do as parents, or what we should be, is guarding our, our children's heart and teaching them how to do that. It says, for out of it are the issues of life. 90% of females that are in mental institutions have been sexually active. I don't say that's a coincidence, folks. We need to guard our hearts because all of our issues in life come from that, that, that member, that, that feeling, that emotion that God's given us when we use it the wrong way, when we excite it at the wrong time. That's where our issues stem from. And so if we're emotionally tied to someone, then we're going to have feelings for it. You know, we see this often where a person says, well, I'm not interested in this particular person anymore. And they, they do what we call break up or break off, whatever you want to call it. But isn't it funny that they're not interested in that person, but oftentimes we find that they don't want that person to be with anyone else? Am I right? That's strange, isn't it? Because there's an emotional tie. If you spend a, a certain amount of time with someone and it's not the right person for you, you're going to forever be emotionally tied to that person. It may be 2%, 5%, I don't know what the percentage is, but you're going to have an emotional tie to that person. And that's when we get into this issue of dating, break, having relationships and breaking them off and dating someone else. And this is an emotional roller coaster. And we're not guarding our heart. We need to be waiting and serving the Lord and, and looking for the Lord to guide us in that area. And our parents to guide us and our pastor to guide us Amen. in that area. Amen. Very important. And I gave you this last week. We'll go very quickly because I talked about it before. I want to give you these three things again. Number one, we need to keep your heart close to the Word of God and prayer. A uh, wise preacher once says that distance leads to destruction. That's so true. Distance leads to destruction. Uh, I was a science teacher for many years, and uh, this law of gravity has to do with distance. The closer two objects are to one another, the stronger the force of gravity is. That's why when you leave the center of the earth, you leave the earth, you begin to go away from the earth, you feel less weight on your body. And you can use that same principle when it comes to God. The further away we get from God, the less we want to be near Him, the less we want to be involved in the things of God. And so we want to stay close to the Word of God in prayer. We learn about the Lord through the Word of God, spend time in His Word. And we know D.L. Moody was the one that said that sin will keep you from this book, but this book will keep you from sin. You've heard that all before. And so how is our prayer like? How is our Bible reading? Number two, keep your heart close to spiritual authorities in your life, your pastors, your Sunday school teachers, people of that nature. I've been doing youth ministry for 17 years, and the first sign I see is when our young people begin to wander away from that authority, and you begin to see that distance sin, and they feel uncomfortable around that leadership. Uh, keep your heart close to those people that you know genuinely love you and care about you. That are going to tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear. That includes your parents. Uh, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of the enemy are deceitful, the Bible says in Proverbs 27 and verse 6. Stay close to them. Proverbs 11, 14, where there no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. Proverbs 15, 22, without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counsel, there are established. You might not hear what you want to hear, but know that you're hearing what you need to hear. And what's needful for your life and for your service to the Lord. I said this before. All it takes is one bad decision to destroy your life for Christ and your cause for Christ. And then thirdly, keep your heart from those who have not given their hearts to God. Turn to 2 Samuel, if you will, real quickly. We know the story. Very familiar. But I want us to turn there anyway because I want us to see some wording here in this story. In Proverbs 13, 20, the Bible tells us, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Yep. Shall be destroyed. Yep. Oftentimes, as a counselor, I'll see young people hanging out with the wrong crowd. I'll see one man that gets, young man that gets in trouble, and there goes his friend. With the same type of appetite. Uh, you show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. We've all heard that. But in 2 Samuel 13, look at verse 1, if you will. We see the story of Absalom and Amnon and Tamar, his sister. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 1, a very familiar story, but we're going to look at it again anyway. It says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful or fair sister whose name was Tamar, and Amnon, the son of David, what? He loved her. Okay? Loved her. Now, when I looked this word up in the original language, it was actually a mixed feeling. It was a brotherly love, but it was also a sensual love. So it was two different types of love. There was a confusion here. In verse 2 it says, And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And so we see the lustful type of thing here. And it says, And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. So we see that there was a struggle in the flesh there. Uh, every man is tempted, but when he's drawn away of his own lust, the Bible says. 
We all have that flesh. You know, oftentimes I hear parents say, you know, my child's such a good old child. He's a good, they would never do anything. I'm thinking to myself, last time I checked, the Bible says we all have flesh. We all have the same temptations. I'm not saying we don't have good young people around here, but I'm saying we all can be tempted. We all can fall. Be careful about that. Guard your heart. Guard your flesh. And the Bible says here in verse 3, it came down to a certain friend. Look at verse 3. The Bible says, but Amnon had a what? Friend. I don't need to go any further than that. He had the wrong type of friend. And we know the story from there. He, he raped his own sister. Based on the plan that his friend and advice that his friend gave him. It was based on the wrong counsel. And by getting that wrong counsel, his life was destroyed. And the story just goes down and goes from there. But you get my point, amen? And so we got to be careful that we hang around the right people. That we spend some time with those uh, who love us and who have uh, ministered to us the word of God. And that's so important that we do that. And so the first commandment, I love this because it ties right into what we're saying. In Matthew 22 and verse 37, we see the first commandment. God gives priority to this commandment. In verse 37 in Matthew 22, it says, But Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. He said, what is God's will for my life is right there. Simply love the Lord. Be content with the Lord. Because can, can I let you know a little secret? If you don't love the Lord, you're not content with him. You're not going to be happy in marriage either. Marriage is not meant to make you completely happy. It's your relationship with the Lord that's meant to be, make you content. I believe that's what Paul was preaching all throughout the New Testament. Amen? That whatever state we're in, to be content. Be content in Christ. I, I don't know about you, but just knowing that I'm saved, and sometimes it's a struggle, but I, I find contentment in that, knowing that one day when I die, the worst thing that can happen, I go to heaven. Right. Anything that's added to that is just a blessing. Amen? And so as a young person, can I tell you this? As a single young person, stay focused on the Lord. Serve Him. A single life is a serving life. Enjoy serving the Lord. So when you get married, you'll meet that one that loves serving you too, and you can Amen. serve them together and continue on that journey. Right. And that's what it's all about. Find that contentment in Him. And then we say here that with all, how with all thy soul and with all thy mind, so we see that, that protecting, that guarding the heart. You say, well, how do I guard my heart from the wicked device of the world? By simply falling in love with Jesus. Amen. Making him your priority. As simple as that. In 38, it says this. And this is the first. And I love the second part. It's added with emphasis and great commandment. We find that the, the, the whole uh, theme of the New Testament is love, isn't it? We, we find the Old Testament is the law. But in the New Testament, it's love. And in Romans 13 and verses 8 through 10, it tells us that everything we do for Christ, that because we're not necessarily under the law as far as keeping the law, but we're under Christ and have the liberty now to serve him with freedom, that everything we do now for the Lord should not be because we're under the law, but because we're, we love the Lord. Isn't that not right? That's what the Bible teaches. So everything we do is generated by the love now. And so if we love him, we'll do more than what the law requires. Right. Amen. If we love our Savior. So let him, keep your eyes on him. And so because our heart are of great value to God, you and I must do our part in protecting it. By the way, can I just add this? There's nothing more that we can offer the Lord than our heart. That's what he wants. We can't offer him money because he didn't need our money. But he has chosen to use you and I. Think about that for a moment. We're wicked sinners and God chooses to use us. That's really what he wants. He wants our hearts. You know, you make data around. You may do your own thing. You may say, you know what, I know what I'm doing. You may shrug this off. Can I just tell you something? When it comes down to it, you simply need to trust God in this area of your life. And trusting God means trusting those in authority above you that are teaching you the word of God. You may not agree with everything, but just simply trust it anyway. You know, some of the things that God told some men in the Bible to do doesn't make sense to you and I, does it? That's right. But it always turned out all right, didn't it? Amen. It always turned out all right. We got to trust. And parents, I want to challenge you the same way. Would you do your part in this area? We've been talking for six weeks now. Would you do your part? Would you not fall for what the world is saying and what they're doing, but simply trust by you? So, well, no one else is doing it that way. Where everyone else is wrong. Hey, Amen? Right. And the Bible is right. You know, wrong is wrong no matter how many people are doing it. It's right is right no matter how many people are doing that. That's just, that's what we need to get to as Christians. That's where we need to be. Make up our minds we're going to do what's right no matter what the cost. Hey, Amen? Right. We're bombarded with bad behavior today. Society, sex saturated society. I don't know if you realize, but everything is saturated by sex. You know, I used to be into the comics, but now you go watch a movie based on the comics and it even has romance and sex and that, and sensuality and that. There's nothing you can do that's not tied to this because this is the number one seller industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry, pornography is. And it's sex sells, and that's what the money's about. It's about money. The love of money is the root of all evil. And that's what we follow. 
And so we're bombarded by, we're overwhelmed with images and examples of all these things. We need to break the chains of control the media has on our young people. They're erasing our young people today. I'm not going to even comment on these. I'm just going to show them to you. <laughs> okay? I'll let you use your imagination this morning. If we're awake. I look at us as my own mind. <laughs> just the names of some of these TV shows. You can go to the website and type the top 10 or 100 TV shows a day and just look at the names of them. You don't even watch the shows. This is what we find when we want to send young people to camp nowadays. They don't want to leave their cell phones without their computers behind them for a week to go be with the Lord. That's what we find. Reality TV. Wow. Psalm of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 7 again. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he pleases. It's stated three times in that psalm. That's a song of the book of love, a loving relationship between a husband and wife, and we find that stated there until the right time. Well, marriage between one man and one woman would be the contest of the entire song of Solomon. Thus, we can safely assume that Solomon is warning women of all ages not to allow their love to be awakened until marriage, when it can be fully expressed without hindrance. The Bible says that uh, marriage is honored before, before God in the bed undefiled. God gives us free reign in our marriages, but not outside the confines of marriage the way the world depicts it. And so it can be fully expressed without hindrance and with God's complete blessing on that relationship. And so what causes love to be awakened? Now, this is a very controversial topic. We know that the Bible says it, I believe in 1st or 2nd Corinthians in chapter 7, it talks about uh, that a man ought not to touch a woman. We talked about that six weeks ago, that that refers to a sensual type of touching. You say, well, what, what is okay and what's not okay? I can tell you what we see nowadays in the media and what we see on TV. You know, in these reality shows, they have some what they call Christian reality shows where they have these young men and they're, they're, they're bragging about the fact that they're virgins but let me just tell you this, they're doing everything they can to get as close as they can to having sex without actually doing it. And they're calling themselves pure. I don't think that's what God intended. God gave us, again, those feelings and emotions to prepare to have children and have a family. And so with that being said, there's things that lead up to that. And those things that we do will awaken those passions in us, and we ought not arouse those things that we cannot fulfill. Right. That's what the Bible teaches we need to be very clear about that. You say, well, can we hold hands? We're going to talk about that. Now, everybody is different, but yet everyone's the same. What I mean by that is we all have temptation and feelings and emotions, but what triggers us in some areas, maybe some may be a little bit more sensitive in some areas than others. Uh, sometimes two people can hold hands and it doesn't do anything. And others, they can hold hands and there's fireworks go off and they explode. But I'll leave that to the parents to decide what they allow in their homes. But I'm just going to tell you physical contact, and especially the wrong type of physical contact, can lead to something else. It really can. It can cause two people to get a lot closer than what they ought to, and so forth, and so so, so on. So we see that here. But the, this lust of feeling can be interpreted as love in the heat of the moment. You can get so close and spend so much time together touching that eventually it begins to awaken some of that flesh there that should not be awakened too early, and it can lead to you somewhere where you don't want to go. You say, well, how far should I go? Again, I mentioned it again, it's not just about saving your, your, yourself from marriage in the area of the physical sex area, but it's saving everything from marriage. I don't know about you, but to be there at that altar and to be able to say I'm kissing you for the first time would mean something. should mean something. You say, well, we've been together for a year or two, and we know each other, and we, we feel very comfortable with one another. Can I just tell you this? You may not think this, but psychologically something goes on in the mind of a person when You've been kissing before that marriage day. And maybe that's the only person you've ever kissed, and maybe you will marry him. I don't know until that day comes. But when it does come, that man will walk away from the altar thinking, well, if she kissed me before that marriage day, how do I know I can trust her? If she did that before our marriage, you say, well, you, you, you're going off on deep end. That's well, no, I'm not. There are things that happen without us realizing that are happening in our thoughts. And trust is the number one thing that we need in our marriage, love and trust. Amen. So important that we get that. Saving that first kiss for that day, that special day. Isn't that why we wear the white dresses? What do they represent? Purity, right? Keeping ourselves pure, guarding our hearts. Did not God uh, invent kissing so that it would lead to something further? 
Is that not right? Amen. There's things that lead up to the actual action of sexual activity. It really does. And so those, those are things that arouse us. We need to stay away from those borders. And so with the culture that screams the, the opposite, where nothing is saved regarding the kept secret, you must be committed to not allowing your love to be awakened prematurely before it's time. It's so important we get that. Why no physical contact? You need to understand the potential connections from any sort of physical contact, like kissing, and in most cases, even holding hands with the member of the opposite sex. You know, oftentimes I'll joke around and I'll say, hey, do you have a younger brother or sister? Then hold their hand. You're looking for someone to hang out with? Well, hang out with uh, uncle or aunt or someone else. If that's what you're looking for in a relationship, but that's not why we get into a relationship in the first place. We're looking for that person that God has for us. It's not just to try it out or I'm lonely. That's what the world teaches. Amen? Right. That's not what the Bible teaches. We need to be careful about that. And so if it can't be done without a living love, according to Solomon, it probably shouldn't be done until marriage. It probably should not be done until marriage. Now, I don't believe we can err on the side of being too safe. Do you? Right. Do you? I don't believe that. That's when it comes to raising my children. The benefits are endless in life, including less heartache, less emotional, physical, spiritual, and mental baggage to work through, increased blessings and satisfaction from being in God's perfect will. I believe the majority of our Christians today, and I'm probably included in that bunch, will never be able to experience all that God has for us because of the mistakes that we made even before our salvation. Right. I really believe that. I was talking to Sarah yesterday about that, about how when we get married, especially someone like me who got married in their early 20s, we carry baggage into our relationship. We talk about that weight of sin that God lifts off us. That's so true. He does give us that peace when he saves us. But the baggage of the life that we live before is still there and it needs to be dealt with. That's why we have marriage counseling and biblical counseling after marriage, even before marriage. Because there are issues that we need to deal with that do come up later in life. And that's why the more you keep yourself pure, young people, now, the less issues you'll have later. It is so true. Every single choice you make, from the seemingly small ones to the bigger ones, will have some type of effect on your life. We're going to conclude this by reading a letter. I'm going to have one of our young ladies come up and read a letter to you. And I pray that as she's reading that letter that you'll make some promises to the Lord in your heart. These are not something you need to share with anyone else. If you want to share with your parents, you can. But I also want to share, challenge our parents as you listen to this and our grandparents that God will move you to put up some safeguards in your families as well. Nearly 16 years ago, I made a decision that has forever shaped my life. Never once have I regretted this choice. On the contrary, there have been more times than I count where I have been so thankful because making the decision in advance gave me courage to resist, resist temptations I have faced over the years. My decision came in the form of a letter that I wrote to God in regards to my future husband. I always thought this letter would be something so personal that I would only show my husband on our wedding day. But I believe God wants me to share it with you in order that you too might be prompted to make some commitments of your own. I'll let you in on a little secret. When I wrote this letter as a 16-year-old, I thought the same things that many of you may think. I assumed that I'd probably graduate from high school, go to college, and be happily married by age 21, or 23 at the latest. But I'm almost 32 years old now, and still not married. I had no idea that I'd be single this long. Yet, I am still hanging on to the decision I made to remain sexually pure at all costs, and save every last part of myself for my future husband. The wait hasn't been easy. But I know it will be worth it one day when I give my husband the gift of my purity. As you read the following, please know that I am not at all suggesting that you have to make the same decision I made. The Holy Spirit places different convictions on each of our hearts. The important thing is that you obey what he is asking you to do and be sure that your actions line up with the guidelines God gives us in his word, the Bible. You absolutely cannot go wrong when you obey him. Remember, God created men, God created women, and God created sex. So you and I would be wise to follow his advice on this issue. Here are the parts of the letter I wrote to God as a 16-year-old. Tuesday night, June 18, 1996. Father, you know my heart tonight. And you know exactly what I am thinking and feeling. After a lot of thinking, Bible reading, and praying, I decided to make a promise between you and myself and my future husband. It may sound like a stupid promise, but I think it is something that will work well for me and help me. I promise that I will not kiss a guy until my wedding day, when I know for sure that he is the one I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. I want a first kiss to be extremely special, not something that is done out of habit or a brief desire. I want my husband to be a man who loves you with all his heart and who cares enough about me to save sex and other forms of physical contact until marriage. I want a relationship that does not require physical intimacy in order to exist. I want a husband who will love me and care for me simply because of who I am in Christ. 
not because of my looks or outward appearances. I want a husband who will love me unconditionally in the same way you love me. I also want you to fill me with unconditional love for my husband. I want a marriage that is Christ-centered and will not fail because my husband and I will be committed to God first and foremost and to one another with a love that grows every day and brings more and more excitement into our marriage. I know that the only way to get the true fulfillment and satisfaction from sex is by saving it until marriage. Thank you for giving me something so wonderful that I can save and give to my husband on our wedding night. Be with him right now and through the day to keep him through the days to come. Keep him pure and give him the desire to save himself for me. Watch over him and make him into the godly man you want him to be. Right now, I may or may not know who my husband is going to be, but Father, please bring us together in your time and we are both ready to begin a relationship in our lives together. Thank you for being a father I can share my feelings openly with. Thank you for loving me and caring about me. Make me into the godly woman that you want me to be and give me the qualities of a wife that would be honoring to, to you. Help me to remember this promise when I am faced with temptations and give me the strength to carry it through. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Thank you for loving me. As I read through that letter again nearly 16 years later, I am overwhelmed with the gratitude that the Lord gave me such a strong desire at a young age to remain as pure as possible. Not only did I want to save sex for marriage, but God allowed me to see the value of every one of my kisses and all other forms of physical and emotional attachment. God gave me and each of you the treasure of my purity, so I wanted to be wise in whom I shared my treasure with. On the night that I wrote this letter, I decided that my husband was the only one I would ever give my treasure to. I didn't want to casually give it away to boys I might go out with that might have given me a brief moment of pleasure, but I decided I was willing to sacrifice that moment of pleasure for a lifetime of satisfaction and fulfillment with my husband. After all, that's the way God intended it to be. As a 16-year-old, there were many things I did not yet understand about relationships, but I had observed much through watching other girls my age, as well as girls younger and older than me. I saw far too many of them carelessly giving away pieces of their hearts and bodies to guys who were only passing through. God allowed me to see the value of saving all of me, my mind, my body, and my emotions for the man I would one day marry. The decision has helped me guard my purity as if I was guarding a billion dollars and all the tools in the world. I'll be writing more about this in the future, but for now I want to be sure you know that every single part of your emotions, your heart, your physical body is extremely valuable. When you believe that to be true, you are more cautious about who you give pieces of yourself away to. Think of yourself as a rose. Roses are beautiful, and women in particular feel extra special when they receive a rose. Rose petals contain a wonderful fragrance that lessens when petals are removed. So for every kiss you give to a guy, it's like you've handed him one of your rose petals. The same is true for each touch and emotional attachment you give away. As more and more petals are given away, your unique fragrance becomes less strong. But the more petals you guard and hang on to, the sweeter your special fragrance remains. Imagine how honored your husband will be one day when he realizes you saved all your rose petals just for him. I fully believe that God can and will create new rose petals, so to speak. He is a God of second chances and new beginnings. So if you have already given some of your petals away, don't be discouraged. Just guard your remaining petals a bit more carefully. Save them for your future husband. He will be glad you did. You may be 10 or 11 years old, or you might be 18 or 19 and approaching the end of your teenage years. Whatever the case, know that it is possible to stay sexually pure throughout adolescence and on into your college and adult years. I am living proof of this. With God's help, you can do it. Will it be difficult at times? Absolutely. But if you have chosen beforehand the degree to which you are willing to go to stay pure, notice. I did not say decide how far you can go physically and still be your virgin. It will be so much easier to resist than walk away when temptations come. I encourage you to talk with your mom, an older sister, a friend, as well as the Holy Spirit and ask them to help you come up with specific standards and boundaries you will commit to for maintaining your purity. Perhaps you will want to write a letter to your future husband telling him of your commitment to save all of your treasure for him. Or maybe you want to do as I did and write a letter to God. Either way, you can be confident that God will honor the decisions you make today. Your patience and willingness to save and guard your treasure while waiting for Him will be more than worth it. I'm so proud of you. Amen. Amen. Just remember Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. The greatest gift you can give to that, that one that you love is your heart. And that's what God wants from us. It's a picture of our relationship to Christ.
in our relationship with our spouse. It's so important we get that. And as parents, we need to model that relationship to our children. And parents, take that burden of, of that uh, dating life off your kids and assume that role of helping them and guiding them in that area. And so things will be so much better. Amen? Right. Let's pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for the word of God. Lord, this is challenging, especially in the world and day and age that we live in today. We're bombarded with the media and society and uh, the social media on, 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 through Facebook and other uh, types of venues. And Lord, I just pray that we would realize that we still have the book. We still have the instructions that you've left us, not only to know you, but to live for you. And Lord, if we uh, meditate in that book, as the Bible tells us in Joshua, day and night, that we'll find our way prosperous and then we'll find success. Lord, help us not to live as the Gentiles do, who know not God, but help us to focus on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to give them our hearts and love him. Help us to raise our young people to love the Lord, to serve him out of love, not out of duty, uh, to have a passion for what we do. The Bible says that we need to be fervent in spirit to serve the Lord. Lord, if we've already made some mistakes as parents, Lord, help us at this point to rectify those things, to uh, repent and just ask for forgiveness and, and ask for strength to help us and wisdom to help us to raise our, our children to honor you. Uh, Lord, I pray for our young people who maybe made some wrong choices. I pray that you would work in their lives now and help them to accept this challenge of doing things the Bible way. To understand that the way the world does things is evident of what they lead to by what we see in our society today. We're teaching our young people to divorce before they even get started. So Lord, help us now to be dedicated to loving you with our whole hearts, finding contentment in you, and then we will find success in our future marriages and our mates. We'll, we'll desire what you desire, Lord, when our hearts are close to you, because we'll want what you want for our lives. And so we thank you so much for these simple truths, but yet things that we need to apply. I pray that you give everyone in this room courage, wisdom, and strength in these areas, because this is where it starts, God's first institution, the home. This is the first institution that Satan attacked because he knew that if he can get into the home, he could break society and break in the legions of people of godly heritage. And we give you praise on your Lord in all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We just missed.